Thank you very much. Uh, pleasure to be here. I will call out um, some of my fonts do get a little bit small, so if you're in the very back of the room, unless you have binoculars, you might want to sit um, forward. Uh, so before we get started, just out of curiosity, how many people um, are SREs and use Terraform or OpenTOFU on a regular basis? About half the room. How many are developers that are interested in uh, contributing to the project? Okay. Um, Anyone not used Terraform previously or not aware of where it's at? Anyone looking for a talk on tofu or tofu manufacturing? <laughs> Excellent. Um, that'll be covered in the part two uh, to be given sometime next year. My name is Jess Mails. I've been a sysadmin for 20 years. I do very much strongly consider myself a sysadmin. My preferred pronoun is ops or ops. Um, as such, give me a terminal, preferably bash. Give me an editor, preferably them. Give me a command line game like Doom. Um, all this squarely puts me in the camp of Greybeard, which I don't mind, I accept, it happens. Greybeards are known for knowing their tools well, but also there's a little bit of attitude of get off my lawn or stuck in the past. But that being said, there's some very formidable Greybeards out there. So again, it's a, it's a camp I'll have, happily embrace. But to be not stuck in the past, um, and just to make sure that I'm comfortable with modern tooling, not that I wasn't, but to really dig in, to really embrace that, uh, I wanted to look at the open tofu code base. And so what I'm hoping that you get out of this talk is that if you want to break into this thing, it's very easy, it's very accessible, and if I can understand it, you can too. My whole goal for today is I want you guys to be able to walk away from here and not have any fears about being able to look at this code base or work with this code base, uh, even if you've never contributed or, or looked at this kind of level of code before. So, what is Open Tofu? Uh, again, you guys identify that you're broadly familiar with what the tool does. Its infrastructure is code. On the um, on my left, you're right. I probably got that backwards. Anyways, on one side of the screen, you'll see a sample bit of uh, Terraform code. On the other, you know, of course, you'll have to plan that out. The code tells you what it's going to implement. You apply it. It implements that. And by codifying all this in code, now all of a sudden we've got a time machine around what our infrastructure is. Uh, we can move forward and backwards. We can make changes. And we've got that history and also that identification of what needs to be built and how it needs to be built. Open Tofu, of course, is a fork of Terraform. Uh, open source, community driven, and managed by the Linux Foundation. Why was it forked? Uh, mid last year, HashiCorp, uh, after nine some years of open development under an MPL v2 license, decided to switch to a BSL license. Uh, there was little to no warning given to the community, and so there was quite a bit of reaction about this. Um, I'm not going to dive into the politics of what they did. Um, I think there's other benefits coming out of this, but just as a gauge of reaction, there was quite a bit of blow up. I watch Hacker News on a regular basis. Uh, I'm sure there's other gauges of the community. This is not statistical or um, highly validated at all, but again, quite a bit of community interest, quite a bit of blow up. And with that, uh, the Open Tofu, they started as OpenTF, but Open Tofu as a project was formed and started going. And so some of the timeline is that August 10th, uh, HashiCorp announced their change by August 15th and then August 25th, uh, OpenTF is announced and then we've had releases since then. Uh, public repos were started on September 5th and then uh, alpha release in October as we see beta release in November and actually considering the current state of the projector, no slides are as dark as this so we'll quickly move on. But my view is that competition is healthy. And so Open Tofu, as an upstart, is very much interested in expanding features and expanding capabilities because they're trying to convince you to use this new tool. Um, as much as there might be ideology involved, it's very hard to run your business on ideology. Uh, and it's very hard to convince management to make changes uh, regarding ideology. But separately, as the incumbent, Terraform should want to innovate because now all of a sudden they can't just rest on the laurels, they can't just sit still. As a quick note, most of the providers were not changed in their licenses, though they're still released. 
under MPVL2, and this should be a strong unifying factor, making sure that there's not too much drift between the products. So with the idea that there's going to be competition, have we already seen that competition start to manifest? And uh, tentatively, yes. Um, I did a quick survey. This is, again, by no means scientific because, again, as we all know, semantic versioning has no definitive increments, uh, judging by release numbers. Some projects have been in beta forever. Some uh, decide when they want to move on. So, But counting roughly days between release, we have seen that uh, 155 was when they announced that they would switch over, uh, starting with 1.6, and 1.6 was released in... Uh, October 4th of last year for HashiCorp, and then uh, beginning of this year, uh, 1.7 they released, they're already on track with 1.8, the beta just came out uh, two weeks ago. And as we can see, all of a sudden that change, that increase, is happening over time. And so understanding those changes, we use tools like version control to understand what goes on. Uh, with version control, we can quickly see the differences and the changes over time. Um, unfortunately, as a side effect of copying that repo, they dropped all previous tags. So if you go to open Tofu today, you'll find the 1.6 tags, and that's about it, which is a little bit unfortunate because you want to compare uh, against very past iterations such as 0 0.12, 0 0.15, even 1.4. Um, you'll not be able to reference it by tags. Again, it's Git, the commits are still there, you'll still be able to read all the notes, but that handy rough spec isn't immediately available, but we can restore it. And so, clone your open tofu repo, uh, add your remote ref to Terraform, and then fetch away. Now, you will want to take a couple extra steps to make sure that your tags are maintained. Uh, you've got a one-time line of disabling tag pruning uh, during the fetch, which means that as it goes out to update its repos, it doesn't drop uh, any existing tags that may not be present on that remote server. Um, separately, this second comment line here uh, just clears up all tags because in the next step, we then go in and uh, rename all the tags, prefacing them with either open tofu or Terraform. And so now, if you want to, you can do that diff that we had in the previous slide of Terraform v.14 against v.16, see those changes and get those on an easy reference. Now, doing it this way will grab all the changes, and so uh, we've got that very important line at the bottom. We, because of the relicense in the code, we don't want too much bleed there. In fact, we don't want any bleed. Do not copy your code uh, from Terraform and try and commit it to open tofu. Uh, so if you want to be a little bit safer, you can specifically fetch the tags that are historic only. Uh, that being said, it is a little bit of a bear because you're then going in by uh, individual uh, branch names to filter out what not to collect. And then as time moves on, if we ever move to a 2 release, 3 release, that's going to keep on continuing unless somebody's much smarter with a glob and wants to suggest a much nicer way of filtering that. Um, so. What's our model of what OpenTofu does as infrastructure as code? Again, we already saw some code. We saw that the plan goes out and uh, identifies what needs to be made. The apply actually goes out and implement it. So we've got a series of resources that are dependent upon each other. Um, maybe we've got RDS instances, EC2 instances. Maybe we've got an IAM and policy uh, that needs to be uh, instanced, and so all of these things start building up, and they start associating with each other. This all comes in together as a directed acyclic graph. Nobody ever calls it that, it's a DAG. Uh, but what that means is the acyclic part means that the, the pointers only go in one direction, so you'll not get loops, which is very important. Because if the loops happen, you're gonna get um, circles in your resolution, and then of course it's gonna get stuck, it's gonna run forever, and that's not something you really wanna desire. Um, so then, boom, we've got our code on one side, we've got our to or tofu when it runs, starts matching up the resources with 
it's in structure memory of what that graph looks like. It starts matching up those resources that you've defined in your code. And then it goes out and looks at the infrastructure, matches that up, and then as part of the plan operation, does the processing, comes in and tells you, okay, this is what I'm going to do. If you were to apply, it goes and does it. And so with that mental model in place of it constructing this, it taking that graph, it walking that graph, it trying to decide what it needs to do in each individual case, let's go ahead and look at that from the outside in. And Tofu has some um, very nice logging features. It's just TF log equal trace in your environment. And then all of a sudden it starts spinning it out. There's several options for tracing if you want to get more or less for both. Um, if you want to get only half, the core part is for CLS CLI. The provider part is for, of course, your provider, AWS, local, um, null provider, what have you, uh, GCP. So if you want to collect one set of logs, uh, that's fine because as we'll see later, those get quite voluminous. And then if you want to, you can also set TF log path and all of a sudden it starts appending all its logs rather than writing to standard error uh, across the screen, it starts writing to those individual logs. So let's look at that real quick. Um, One. What have I got here? Terraform data. It's basically a null resource. Um, all it does is it creates a vision, revision. It does this local exec of touch a file. And this is, for demo purposes only, this code pretty much does nothing. It's a great example because what does it do? Uh, to initiate this, I did the command previously described, that TF log. I've captured the trace log already. That's in these two, four files. Uh, the output is just the normal uh, standard out that you would see the standard error uh, was captured in the trace files. And so real quick, from this null provider example, uh, how many lines does that even produce? Seven hundred and eighty lines. So, quite a bit of output, quite a bit of detail about what it's doing and how it's doing. Uh, the reason why I particularly start doing this count is because when you start looking at other providers, uh, AWS specifically, uh, here, all I'm doing is just uh, get caller identity. It's a basic call into uh, the token service to say, who am I? What am I doing? Um, and it's just a data call. It's not even trying to create resources. When this runs, how many lines does it produce? 3,500, so five times the amount uh, in just making that simple call. If you actually want to create infrastructure, Here's a lambda, it goes on. I did not save, so let's do this count real quick. That's even better. So again, if we're doing a much larger resource, how many lines is it going to produce? I expect this number 25,000. So lots of output uh, as soon as you start doing those cloud providers. It's useful information, but again, it's quickly very easy um, drowning in a, in a sea of details. So swapping back, what's in one of these trace files? And with the cut, I'm just taking out the uh, timestamps that would be the first column uh, because that quickly becomes distracting. So let's just walk through it. Uh, it starts up, it tells us the version, it goes in, tells us some CLI output, 
it says, hey, attempting to open config file dot terraform rc. Did you even know you had a generic system-wide config file? Um, here we actually use it. Uh, in development, we use this file to override our providers. Um, but again, in watching the output, we can follow along with what it's doing. So remember, it's going to try and build that graph. It's going to then look at that graph with the known state. It's going to then compare that graph to the actual state in production. And so how does it do that? Uh, coming along, we see it starts up, CLI arguments, goes down, tells us about what the terminals are. Great. Uh, boom. Meta backend. So the backend starts to become a thing because it's now saying, well, we've got state somewhere. I need to load that up. And the back end is where that happens. Uh, it notes, hey, uh, this is the override that I had in my Terraform RC. That's where it's getting that. The back end that it called out to is local. Uh, and it happens to note that uh, the workspace is default. It's looking at the file system for that backend and noting that no previously storage snapshot exists. So it's going to create one uh, and create a lock file associated with it. It creates a context object. Presumably that means something or we'll find out that it does in a minute. Uh, it starts looking at plugins. It then builds and walks the graph. As we said, we'll see more details on that as it works. It then starts seeing config transformer, node validate resource, and then move on. And so all this exercise is to say that Terraform itself is going to tell you voluminous information about what it's doing, how it's doing. And even though it's a ton of information, it is pretty easy to read. And we'll put some of those details about backend and further context in just a minute. But in looking at all this stuff, we started noticing transformers. And so out of curiosity, what are those? What are different types of transformers? Presumably, they're doing something significant for us. And so um, I take the output here. I look for anything uh, that's ending in transformer, uh, single words. The dash O is single words looking for transformers. And then against those, uh, the aw command saying, print out the first time you see it and skip all the rest. I'm not looking for a count of how many times I see these individual transformers. I just want to know the number of distinct transformers that it's coming across. And there's the list. So 47 different transform operations. We're not going to look at them all. We're not going to look at them all. But they're there. They're doing significant still for us. And they're all to be found in the code. So taking a look from the outside, the traces, what they're going to tell us, uh, let's flip our view and take a look from the inside out. So if you've got the repo handy, you can start looking at it. Uh, I'm going to reference everything there. But now it's as if we're reading straight through the code to understand what's going on. There's a very nice architecture.md right there in the docs of the repo, and it has this very helpful graph of process execution. and as it kind of noted, as we're calling out, as reading the, the trace log, the CLI starts up, loads up the back end, starts talking to the state manager. Then we've got this graph builder, graph walking, and at the end, transforms going on, um, which is all that vertex evaluation. So let's dig into this a little bit. The CLI. It's the internal command package right there in the repo. Uh, so open to slash internal slash command. It's mostly scaffolding for us, so it's a very easy to read file. It's going to parse the arguments for us so that we know if we've got changed or as a flag, it's going to know if we've got output specified. Uh, it does all that for us. Uh, it can encrypt, which is something I'll get into in a little bit. Uh, it's a new feature in Tofu, but not necessarily present in HashiCorp. Uh, it starts a backend for us, and it creates a context, and then from that context, kicks off and um, 
context is the main process in memory that holds the DAG and gets walked and moves on from there. So CLI is a basic structure for us. It does do the, um, keeps lock on the state uh, so that too many things aren't changed at one time and we don't overwrite stuff. But importantly, if you don't know Go, it's got a very nice defer feature so that we don't permanently lock that. And so CLI takes care of making sure that that final lock doesn't happen. The configuration loader, which was on the side, uh, basically takes care of tofu init processing. Uh, meaning, goes out, grabs the providers, makes local copies available in your uh, .terraform directory uh, underneath your code repo where you happen to be running. It installs all those child modules into that environment. And then while running, as it reads those from disks, uh, if you've got multiple instantiations of a module, those all get instantiated in memory as multiple copies. And they're fully interpolated so that namespaces don't mix up. And so if you've got um, two versions of an application, each of them get their own copy of that module so that variables don't, um, aren't globally accessible across them and they don't get confused. Um, with a slight caveat that at this point, we're just loading up the config out of the modules, so basically the source code out of the modules. And so it's going to interpolate as much as it can, but it's still going to leave uh, quite, a big, quite a few big chunks of HTL body or HTL expression. Um, just because it doesn't know yet what the count's going to be. It's not actually pulled up those variables of what those are going to be. It'll get all those later. The back end is, represents our workspace first. Uh, even if you don't specify one, you're working on a default. If you specify something else, it takes care, takes care of managing that particular TF state file. Um, the back end interface as a Go language construct um, has two versions, basic and enhanced. Uh, most backends do not actually implement enhanced, so uh, they actually run through local, and local takes care of loading that enhanced on top of it. The enhanced interface basically um, asks for apply remote um, plan features, and so when the execution happens, um, it happens through that interface of Golang through that. The back end calls the state manager. Again, for us, it's file system local. Um, again, just picks up off the disk, pulls that in, it brings us, and then now all of a sudden it loads up that major context, which is represented in the context.go file. Uh, it points to the root of the graph and then kicks off graph walking. And so at this point, we can kind of imagine that the state's been picked up, all the code has been picked up, all those are present in memory, but variables haven't been interpolated. Um, we've done the refresh so that we know what the current state is, but boom, it's still got some work to do. It's chunky. Um, also part of the context, it creates uh, stop hooks, which is, I think about it as a tin can of hey, I'm going to talk on this end, you talk on the other. So if you ever hit control C during the middle of the operation, you've got that channel. Not exactly a Go channel, it's implemented through hooks, but it's got that way of communicating to those sub-processes that I bailed, save your state, uh, you do have a little bit of grace period on that. Our config files are loaded. Each of them basically assigns a resource to a vertex. Uh, be careful reading the code. You will see vertex and node used interchangeably. Uh, vertex is preferred, but um, I didn't actually do a count of how often each term is used. Um, but then context kicks off graph walker, which then starts navigating through that graph. Um, context is the entire execution environment for our code, but then as it comes across each module, it enters enter path and starts off that tofu eval context. And so now you've got, again, those per module environment variables separately namespaced. Um, and so, again, a sub environment, uh, so it can't step on anyone else. It's pretty much doing the same thing. We've subdivided the problem. And then as we go across each vertex, it's going to try and do these concurrently where possible, but as it's build up and it's transformers later, there's going to be dependencies, so it will respect those. Um, the transformers as they happen, here's a sample of four. 
but you can read your own. There's plenty in there. The config transformer populates config from code, turning them into resources. What does that mean? It means it's actually loaded up the module library, whatever uh, HTML you've written in your local files, and then it matches those uh, to resource vertexes. Um, state, form, state transformer basically does the same thing, except it's the side pulling in from state. Um, then finally, reference transformers actually come along and say, that's the actual matching of determining, okay, these are the things associated and pairing them up. And so if you've got cross dependencies, it's doing that matching on that graph building. And then provider transformer comes along and says, oh, okay, well, you expect to be a type AWS EC2 instance, great, we're gonna map you back to the provider to make sure that code gets loaded before we even go on. How would you write your own provider? Uh, in doing that, it's actually pretty straightforward. There's a very nice uh, series of developer examples available, uh, but there's two versions. So um, I will caution, uh, make sure you get the latest one, uh, that being the Terraform Provider Scaffolding Framework, uh, which helpfully they made the name very similar to Terraform Provider Scaffolding. So make sure you get the framework one there. The newer um, framework is more strongly typed previously. Um, in the older style, you had to do a lot of casting and other management yourself. Everything fell back to a Golang basic interface, so getting the types right could be very difficult and sometimes trip you up. The structure provider basically has uh, for itself a metadata method, a schema method, a configure method, data store method, and these are basically registering its capabilities with Tofu itself. Uh, separately, you will have a series of CRUD functions, uh, create, read, update, delete, uh, which are faced more toward your code. In fact, I'm going to skip ahead. Your provider being the center, it should be a very thin mapping, but on the one side, you've got the configure side, which faces open tofu. You've got uh, configure, metadata, um, data sources, resources, those are all facing so that OpenTofu can come along and read you. And then those CRUD functions for read and delete talk more toward your API to come out and uh, do those functions. And so that's what I'm referring to on this slide here. Um, they're basically very thin registration methods and um, writing them, you're gonna write five lines of code just saying, hey, here's the functions I'm gonna look up for resources and you just start mapping those forward. As you do development, I will caution you, um, the open tofu uh, framework, uh, there's just some assumptions written about, hey, if you're writing a HashiCorp Terraform provider, you should be referencing Terraform, which was true up until August of last year. Um, so in developing open tofu, you do want to overwrite those. Um, but if you are considering writing a, um, your own provider, keep it as thin as possible. Um, it should be a simple mapping. And then we see that here. Uh, don't try and reinvent the wheel. Follow the leader. Uh, there's some very good examples out there. Uh, Grafana I like because it's smaller and more tractable. Of course, Terraform a provider AWS being the 800 pound grill in the room um, is solid, it's large, it does a lot of great stuff. And so it's useful to look at, but uh, you might get lost in it too. And by means of comparison, uh, the repo size for Grafana is 3 megabytes, 180 Go files, maybe 30,000 lines of code. If you start looking into uh, AWS, then you've got 200 megabytes to deal with, 7,800 files, 2 million lines of code. I find Grafana much easier to read from that standpoint. And then also, when building, um, the document helpfully provides this line. And I'm going to say, for the love of the flying spaghetti monster, don't do this. Uh, rename your binary because the thing you don't want to happen is uh, going into uh, troubleshooting and making changes to what the binary does and you don't want those happening in production and by having the same binary names there's a chance that you uh, mix those up. And then for the truly lazy if you uh, don't like typing uh, tofu 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 uh, give yourself a convenient alias uh, OT. I like this because 
I often forget when I need to init and don't want to pay attention to it. So by default, uh, it's going to check and see if I'm running init or I need to run init and create it if I do, uh, and then move on. And then that else statement just if I type in plan, everything else falls through, or if I type in apply, everything else falls through. So if I need to do uh, shorten state or anything like that, uh, it just falls through. If you're not familiar with Golang and want to get started involved, I recommend this book highly. Uh, particularly, Chapter 3 is a great overview of Golang. Um, how many have done significant projects in Golang? Okay. Chapter 3, for the rest of us, um, I can't remember the page count, but coming from Python and being very comfortable with Python, it's just a great adaptation, runs through the major features. It's a very great way to get up to speed with uh, what Golang does, how it works, and what its larger thoughts are. If you are looking to get involved with the Open Topic community, Slack uh, is a great place to chit chat with others. Also, there's issues boards, uh, which is very nice to see what features people are missing or what's not working well. If you want to stay involved with the larger project, uh, we actually publish weekly updates in the repo itself, which are very nice to read. The steering committee. Um, meets on an as-needed basis. Uh, the last time they met was in February, but their notes are published with part of that. The steering committee makes decisions about longer-term project efforts, S hopefully getting a yes or no of we want to go in that direction, we don't, just to help people understand that, yes, this is where you want to spend some development time or not, just so that people don't spin their wheels. And then finally, the release notes, of course, are good. Um, the project has been, of course, running since last August. What have we, what state, or what work is there to show for it? Uh, state encryption has been added. So, if you want to further protect your secrets, your other production values, API keys, what have you, uh, you can do that now. You can either choose to protect the whole file or just partial. Um, you can also choose to protect plans. So, if you want to run, or if you want to protect secrets while they're in your uh, CI/CD environment that can happen as well. That's pretty nice. If you are going to contribute, um, following up and raising issues, there's a couple of templates on their GitHub page for doing that. Um, you can file simple bugs, you can file feature requests. If you've got the idea of a longer feature and really know all the details of what you want to do, you can write it up as an RFC and they've got some structure for that as well. If it's a minor bug fix, go ahead and write a PR, but if you think there needs to be a larger change, um, we appreciate the enthusiasm, but do uh, open up a PR first and get some community interest because if it's not going to align with larger goals of the project, they don't want you to spin your wheels and spend too much time developing something that isn't likely to get used or have to be refactored, and so save yourself some time, get the alignment first before you start hacking out too much code. That was my quick overview. Any questions at this point? Questions, uh, please, into the mic. Well, thank you for allowing me to present, and uh, if you do have questions, uh, I'll be up here after the panel.